turn in our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> the theme of 2 Peter is to keep on growing in grace as a Christian. And tonight we're going to continue this theme as we read verses 16 through 21 in chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Stand together, please. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 16, and reading through the chapter. Let's read it aloud together. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Thank you, be seated. And since this comment is not integral part of the message, I want to make it because I think it's important. The Catholic Church has used verse 20 as a justification for individual persons, Catholics, not to read the Bible. And they have said that it is here it says that the Bible, no scripture, is of any private interpretation. Uh, they have reasoned in the past, and I can't tell you what all of them have done, what they're doing now. I think there have been some changes. But they have said that you're not to read the scripture for yourself because it will confuse you. You let the priest tell you what the Bible says, and because it says here it's not of any private interpretation. Well, that is not what it's talking about. But I'm going to tell you what it's talking about a little bit later on as we go in our scripture. Now tonight... I want to deal with some essential beliefs that help us to grow in grace. And he mentioned specifically three here that I want to point out. Let's recap what we've done in chapter one, bringing us up to date and helping us get the feel of what the Word of God is talking about. When you're born again, that's the front end of the Christian life, and you're supposed to keep on growing in the Lord. And as long as you are growing as a Christian, you are joyful and you are useful to Christ. But when you quit growing as a Christian, it doesn't make any difference how much Bible you know, how, how long you've been saved, uh, all of the laurels that you have accumulated and the crowns that you can place at the feet of Jesus. When you quit growing as a Christian, you lose the joy of your salvation and you lose your usefulness to Christ as he wants to use you. And you just have a general uh, deadness toward the things of God. Of course, once you learn the language of time, you can play it a long way. And a lot of times we coast because we can say the right words, and do the things, and fake it, so to speak. What an awful thing it is when we Christians have to fake that thing that ought to be so real and so throbbing and so precious as our vital living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is to be maintained by growing in grace. And he admonishes us that um, God, since God has given unto us all the things that we need for life and godliness, that we need to appreciate God's great and precious promises and to adhere to these great and precious promises that are in his word because it is through these promises of God and only through the promises of God that we're able to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Why is that true? The fact is that even after we're saved, unless we take issue with ourselves 
we're going to do the wrong thing. In other words, there's a constant warfare that's going on even for a believer. Because even after we're saved, there is the proclivity to evil, temptations, and uh, the yearning to be what we desire. That falling back, that living sacrifice that keeps crawling off the altar. And so when we take God's precious promises and we say, well, I feel like this, but God's word says this. Or I think, I don't think the Lord really knows what's going on, so I better do this and discount what his word says. Uh, if we don't know the word, then we're not going to be able to do the word. You, you don't do the word accidentally. So now, he says, and besides all this, then you start adding to that faith, not for salvation, but for growth and grace. And remember he said, you add to your faith what? Virtue. That's integrity, folks. That's ethics. It's not enough to just believe the right things. we would be concerned about living the right life. And if I have a burden for it, you see, have a burden for it. Add to your faith virtue, to your virtue what? knowledge. And that's basically a knowledge of the Word of God and the things of God. It's not talking about making a hundred on algebra and uh, making an A in uh, chemistry. There, there are other verses that might encourage you to do that. But uh, that's not what it's talking about. The spiritual thing, the things of the Lord. You say knowledge. And after knowledge, what do you add? You add temperance. That's self-control. And then after that, you add what? You add patience. And after patience, what? You add godliness. That's the godlike life. That's the kind of life that causes people to feel like they've been in the presence of God. And uh, then after that, you add what? Brotherly, brotherly kindness. kindness. Brotherly kindness. That's love. Brotherly love, literally. And then finally, agape love, which goes out beyond the brothers and sisters in Christ. Now he says... If these things be in you and abound, that is, if you are growing in these Christian virtues, if you're adding these to your faith by growing as a Christian, then what? They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that a growing Christian is going to be a fruit-producing Christian. Now, how do we produce the fruit of a, of a Christian? The fruit of a Christian is basically our effective witness as a Christian. And a Christian that's not growing in the Lord hasn't got any witness to amount to anything. Their witness is a joke. And it takes a growing Christian to have the boldness to do the witness that we ought to do. You see. But he says, he that lacketh these things, what? Cannot see afar off. People that are not growing in the Lord, they, uh, they're not able to think in terms of how, how will this deed that I do today affect me five years from now. They want to do what's popular, what the crowd is doing. Uh, people that lack these things cannot see afar off and they're, they're more effective by advertisements and by what the current trend, and they'll get, Christians will get as close to the devil as they can get without hopefully not sinning, rather than staying as far away from them as they can get, you see. So he that's not growing and she that's not growing as a Christian lacks these things, and they cannot see afar off, you see, and hath forgotten that they have been purged from their sins. I wonder how many times today we've reflected on the fact that Jesus saved us back whenever he saved us. And once we begin to forget that we're saved and when he saved us, we lose a lot of motivation that we need to be what God wants us to be. And then he urges them to give diligence to make your calling and election sure. In other words, are you really saved? Have you been born again? Then take it seriously and take it earnestly. And do your best to so live that your relationship to Christ is a living, sure, vital thing, you see. And we have this promise that if we live that way, and it is hard, it is difficult, with uh, adversaries which they face and which we face. It's not some easy thing. It's easy to be saved, but it's hard to live for Jesus. It is hard to live a godly life. 
So he has this promise. If we are growing Christians, when we meet our maker face to face, there's going to be an abundant, uh, glorious entrance ministered to you and to me when we get over to the other side. And that was my last point this morning, Belinda. You yeah, asked the church training. So, that's the promise and that's uh, the motive for his teaching. Now he says that he wouldn't be negligent to put them in remembrance because he said it's not going to be long until he leaves this tabernacle with flesh. And since he realizes the Lord Jesus told him that he was going to, somebody else was going to take him, he was going to die a, a martyr's death for Jesus. And he knows at this point it's not going to be long. He says, since my time is short, I want to make you remember after I'm gone that you need to grow as a Christian. That you need to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness agape love. I don't want you to forget this, he says. Now he gives them three essential beliefs. Not in that particular order, but as I read it, this is what I see him say. And uh, some other preacher of the gospel, some other Bible teacher, some other student may approach it totally different. I didn't get this outline of, out of any sermon book. But here's what I see him say. Here are three essentials that you need to help you to grow in grace. Now he says in verse 16, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord. Now my attention is drawn, in, drawn to the fact that he is not following cunningly devised fables. Like most of us care a lot more about cunningly devised fables than we care about the Bible, even those of us that love and believe the Bible. Because we'll watch a television set and it's given us these cunningly devised fables and we'll get so engrossed in these series and these things and we wouldn't miss them. We'll skip a day, a week without reading our Bible. Something's wrong, you see. Now we say, well, uh, I don't really believe these cunningly devised fables, these television stories. But let me tell you this, when they're important to you, they are making an impact on the kind of life and the attitudes you have as a Christian. Any person, I don't care who you are, that gets engrossed in a television program in a series, that is having an impact on your mind and on your attitudes. It is watering down your Christian convictions. But that's not the point that he's making here. The point that he's making here is the, the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is one of the major thrusts of the motivation to keep on growing as a Christian. And we'll find as we get into the next chapter how false teachers had come and had tried to undermine these early Christians in this great doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know the Bible teaches that before we finish this sermon, Jesus might come back physically to this earth? Now, he hasn't come back yet, but he's going to come back. And some 318 times in the New Testament, it speaks of the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Now, Peter emphasizes this, and notice what he says here. We believe in this, he says, not because of some cunningly devised fable, but because, number one, he says, of a personal experience that Simon Peter had with Jesus on a holy mount. What was that? Well, you remember it was the Mount of Transfiguration, possibly Mount Hermon, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, brought them up into a high mountain, and was transfigured before him. The Greek word is where we get our word metamorphosis from. Um, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared with him Moses and Elias talking with him. And the Bible, one of the Gospels, says that they spoke of his decease. They talked about his coming glory when he gave up his life on the cross of Calvary for our redemption. But there's something that we often miss as we think of the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. Here was Moses and Elias with him, talking with him. There were Peter, James, John, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Can you imagine that Peter experienced this? 
And then, of course, the voice from heaven, cloud overshadowed them, and the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, you move back into verse uh, 25 of chapter 16 of Matthew, and I'm reading Matthew's account of the transfiguration. It says, For the Son of Man, verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. What's he talking about? He's talking about the second coming. You see. Now he says, And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they shall see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's his second coming, you see. Now, how did that happen? In chapter 17, it goes on to say, and after six days, Peter, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Now here we find Simon Peter saying that um, this made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he uses a reference to this transfiguration experience as a confirmation of Jesus' promise that he's coming again. Obviously, a significant part of this transfiguration experience that Peter, James, and John were privileged to get in on was a foretaste of the second coming of Christ. It would be sort of like my wife baking one of these delicious cakes or pies and she constantly bakes sweets for me. She's wonderful in that regard. We never run out of some cake or pie and sometimes I've got two or three or four different kinds in the refrigerator. So she keeps me sweetened up. Now, if she brings me, say, a big red velvet cake and she says, now this is for you but I'm going to put it in the freezer and in a month we'll have it, you see. Well, now I've got the sort of a foretaste. I know it's there. I know it's coming, but I haven't fully participated in it. Now, that's a crude illustration, no doubt. Any illustration that I would make would be crude compared to the scriptural. But maybe it can help us get an idea of what he's talking about. He's saying that we need to believe deeply in our heart that Jesus is indeed coming again. It needs to be woven throughout our being, throughout every muscle, throughout every bone, throughout every nerve, every blood vessel in our body, that Jesus is coming back the second time to this earth. And we need to believe it in such a way that it affects the way we live, the way we witness, the enthusiasm with which we carry on our work for the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, this is what I saw, and this is my testimony. Now, he wasn't talking about some dream that he had, and listen, I know the Lord in the Bible days spoke to people often through dreams. Uh, I know some that say today that God no longer speaks to people through dreams because we have the Word of God complete, and that is the way that God speaks to us. I would tend to lean in that direction with exceptions. Uh, most of our dreams are just the electrons falling back into place, and they get all mixed up during the daytime, and it's a hard job getting them back in the proper place. I mean, here we are running around in our dreams with our skimpy clothes trying to find a place to hide. I mean, y'all ever dream stuff like that? <laughs> or here we are dangling off of some cliff and we're hanging on to a root or something. Uh, uh, these are the sensible dreams. Most of them haven't got any semblance of, uh, of, of any kind of sanity whatsoever. I don't know, some of you don't dream. I dream hundreds of times every night. It's amazing. Some people never dream. They don't know what dreaming is. But my dreams couldn't have any meaning, most of them at least. I would say this, if my dream is a blessing to others, and fine, but uh, I'm not going to put any credence in, in, in it. Now listen, when people start talking about they dream this or that, or they had a vision this or that, you better wise up and say, listen, I'm not going to listen to cunningly devised fables. 
Even this story about Joseph Smith and him finding the, the plates in the ground and having the urine on the thumbs. It's a fanciful story. And here they, they, they've got the ancient history of the United States of America given to them and, and just recorded. You cannot find one fact, one scintilla of evidence of any historical fact in archaeology in America that would substantiate the Book of Mormon. And yet you have millions of people that are leaving good, solid, mainline Christianity to traipse out the Moors because of Donny Osmond or some, uh, some politician that happens to be a Mormon. Listen, a person can be a, a cultic follower and still be responsible as a businessman or as a politician. Uh, that's not going to get you to heaven. Listen, Simon Peter didn't follow cunningly devised fables. Who was it that had this transfiguration experience? It was Simon Peter. Not a perfect man, but an honest man. Listen, when he lied, he said, I lied. When he denied Jesus, he said, I denied Jesus. When he didn't believe Jesus was going to do something, he said, I didn't believe it. He told on himself. You're dealing basically in Simon Peter with a man of integrity. I know if I got a letter in the mail from Ed McMahon and it says, Tom Murphy, you have won $10 million. You know what I do? I throw that in the garbage can. I don't even open it up because Ed McMahon is lying to me. I haven't won $10 million. I don't even open up the letter. I believe it's a sin to put a 25 cent stamp back on these things to hope that you get your name chosen in the lottery. You're wasting 20, pardon me, 29 cents. It's gone up. <laughs> now, if they sent me a letter that had a 29 cent stamp on it, then I'd return it to them. I would not spend one penny on these things that people send out to you and you hope you're going to get something for nothing. If, um, if, if some uh, clearinghouse publication called me up on the telephone and said with the computer, this is to inform you that you, have, you are a second prize winner and you have won, you know, before they can get out, I said, Mr. Computer, would you please just send that to me in the mail because I don't have time to come. Thank you, clunk, down, because I don't believe that stuff. Cunningly devised fables. Now, if Miss Belinda called me, and uh, I'm here at the church, and she called and said, Honey, there is a, uh, a herd of elephants going down East Hermes Street right now. <laughs> now, you know what I would believe? I would believe there was a herd of elephants going down East Hermes Street. I really would, because Miss Belinda doesn't lie, and she doesn't even kid. <laughs> you know, she, she doesn't kid. She never kids with anything like that. It's beyond her. I mean, she doesn't live in that. So I know that she is a person of integrity. If she said that there's a herd of white elephants walking down East Hermes Street, I believe it, you see. But now, not only does he say, you take my word for what I saw, he moves to something more important than that. More important than his personal testimony, but it's important. And that which is more important is the word of prophecy, which the prophets gave concerning the second coming of Christ. Now listen to what he says here. Verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You see? Now his experience confirming the second coming of Christ dovetailed in with all of the Old Testament prophecies. Literally hundreds and hundreds of possibly thousands of prophecies. I heard some guy say there were 4,000 prophecies. I don't know. I never counted them. But literally hundreds of prophecies concerning Jesus coming the first time, what he would do, is the establishment of his kingdom and his coming again. Now listen, if, if his experience corroborates the word of God, that's fine. But if ever his or anybody else's experience is contrary to the Word of God, then dash the experience aside. You know what most of us do? We interpret the Bible and life on the basis of our experience. That's the most foolish thing in the world that a person can do. Because most people like that are very, very weak in the Scripture anyway. Now listen, he was living in a time in which the Jew took the Old Testament extremely serious. They took it extremely serious. So now when he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and he encourages them to take heed to it because it's, he says, it's like a light in a dark place. Don't we have enough darkness in this world? 
Don't we have enough crime in this city? I see a couple of nights ago somebody executes a man out here on Mishu. The Mishu exit shoots him in the head several times. Uh, not to mention, uh, each day in the paper, I see there have been 34 cars stolen in the city. I see there have been so many robberies in the city, so many burglaries. Literally, over a period of months, many thousands that are reported, not to mention those that are not reported. Don't you think we have enough darkness? What about I've had church members that read every day, not the Bible, when they got up, they got the paper and read their horoscope. Can you imagine? I can't imagine a Christian reading a horoscope on a regular basis anyway. I can see it do it, the person doing it just to find out what it is. But I've had church members and actually to make business decisions. You know, one of the most alarming things that I have heard about and read about in my entire life is the fact that President Reagan and his wife consulted an astrologer in making decisions affecting their life and decisions affecting our nation. To me, that is a tragedy. When God has given us a more sure word of prophecy, and that has nothing to do with astrologers and with people that write horoscopes and so forth. Listen, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. If you want to grow in grace, get away from the Ouija board. Get away from the horoscope. Get away from the astrologers. Our job isn't to condemn them. Our job is to get away from them and stick to what works, and that is the light of God that shines on any dark situation to bring illumination and to bring hope and to bring encouragement and to bring growth in grace. Now, finally, this point. Number one, emphasize the second coming, essentials to grow in grace. Number two, emphasize the veracity of the Word of God as over any other advice or counsel that we might receive or opinion that we might hold. And number three, be very, very careful how you interpret the Word of God and to realize you are accountable to God for how you interpret the Word of God. Now listen, it seems to me that most of the Christians I know are very flippant in their attitude towards what God has to say about anything. In the first place, most of them really don't seem to care. I mean, they haven't got a real burden to find out what does God have to say about my business. What does God have to say about my marriage? What does God have to say about uh, the things, the decisions that I make that affect daily life? Uh, very, very few people are really, really burdened about this. They think if they just get more money and have more fun, that's going to solve most all of their problems. Now, um, he says that this word was not given to us in a harem scarab way, but it was given by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit moved upon holy men of God. These were men of integrity who said, Thus saith the Lord. And everything they said about God was from the Holy Spirit and has either already been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Now, it is with this in mind that we go to the Scripture. Now, it doesn't mean that only the pastor has the capacity to interpret the Scripture. We're not saying that a layman uh, can't interpret it properly. Listen, a little child can interpret the Scripture that the Holy Spirit wants him to understand. If that little child humbles himself and waits before God, and sometimes a little child can interpret the scripture with greater clarity than many adults. Oh, you take the scripture about, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? You're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now you ask these children here tonight, which is worse, to rob God or to rob a man? How many of you children here tonight think it's worse to rob God than to rob a man. Hold your hand up. There's one, two. You think it's worse to rob God than to rob man? Yes, all those that are awake say yes. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not going to ask adults, but I can tell you what, there are a lot of adults that would say, 
It's much better to rob God because if you rob a man, he might shoot you or something. Or, uh, you know, give. But the, what does the Bible say? You see? Now, when we handle the Word of God, we better be very, very careful that we do not interpret it in a selfish way, in a what he calls a private way. We can say, look, my opinion is just as good as anybody else's on this point. That kind of a flippant attitude is extremely dangerous. So if you want to grow as a Christian, don't be arrogant when you open that word. When you, if you want to grow as a Christian, open the Bible, read it, but recognize this Bible is not for you to just take it and make anything you want to make out of it. Let God speak. Let the Bible speak. Let the Holy Spirit speak. Man, this book is more current than today's newspaper. A lot more current. It's amazing what this book is. I heard, I'm going to close with this story. I'm going to tell it as best my memory will recall. I will say it may not be 100% accurate because sometimes I don't remember things 100% accurately. But this is the way I remember the story. I was told about Professor Wayne Ward, who has been a long time professor of New Testament at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's about a funeral that he went to of one of the laymen that he knew when he was just a young man that taught the men's Bible class in a church where he attended. Now he said that this layman, and here he was, a professor at Southern Seminary, New Testament, said that layman was the best Bible teacher he ever heard. It was not until he went to this man's funeral that he learned that the man who was the best Bible teacher, the best Bible teacher that he ever knew, could not read and write. He couldn't believe it. The man's wife told him, he asked, he said, how in the world was this man able to teach the Bible and interpret the Bible and apply it like he did? In a local church, of course, the man, didn't, the man that died just was a men's Bible class teacher in the local church. His wife said, every Sunday night, we would take the passage that he had for the next Sunday I would read it to him several times until he got the feel of it and he tried to memorize it and he would reread re that passage. I would read it back to him until he had memorized the passage. Then all during the week, he would think about that passage and pray over it. And when it came time for him to teach, he would take a Bible and open it, quote the scripture, maybe look down at it like he was reading it. But because of his waiting before God and humility and openness and, and giving himself so much to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit enabled him to understand what the passage meant, to interpret it, and then to apply it. And isn't that a beautiful story to know that uh, he's not just talking here about a Greek scholar and a Hebrew scholar and somebody that has a bunch of degrees. He's talking about a man or a woman who venerates the Word of God who humbles themselves before it and realizes that we're accountable for this precious light that is the only thing that will shine in the darkness of our lives and the light of this, the, the darkness of this world. So, three essentials to keep on growing as a Christian. Number one, make big over the second coming of Christ. Number two, venerate this precious Bible over everything else as your guide. And then number three, be very careful how you interpret the Bible, that you don't interpret it selfishly. And you don't just make it your thing, but it's God's Word speaking to you. Tonight, if you have a decision for Christ, I'll be here to counsel with you and come as the Lord leads and stand together as we sing a hymn of invitation.